Hello, good afternoon everybody, good afternoon. Welcome to the Forum on the Hill. Thank you all for being here today. It's so nice to see all of your smiling faces. It is my great pleasure to introduce today Rebecca Yaman. She is a historical archeologist specializing in urban archeology span and the former director of the Philadelphia branch office of John Milner Associates Incorporated, a company that specializes in historic preservation and cultural resource management. She is the author of Archaeology at the Site of the Museum of American Revolution, which won the 2022 James Dietz Book Prize given by the Society for Historical Archaeology, and Rediscovering Raritan Landing and Adventure in New Jersey Archaeology. So please join me in welcoming Rebecca Gannon. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's the first time I've actually been to one of these events in this building, and I'm so impressed that there are so many, and it's so such a lively community. So um, thank you. Uh, digging in the city of brotherly love, I'm going to try not to read, not to depend on my notes here. Digging in the City of Brotherly Love is um, obviously about Philadelphia archaeology, but I, it's also about urban archaeology in a general sense. And I wanted to start my talk today by telling you about the first urban archaeological project that I did. And it wasn't in Philadelphia, it was in New York. And it was at the site of a federal courthouse that was being built at Foley Square. Foley Square is way downtown in Manhattan next to Chinatown, and there's a whole bunch of uh, courthouses at Foley Square, so, so this is the new one that has joined that bunch. So because it was being built with federal money, they had to do something which is called a cultural resource survey in compliance with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Most of the archaeology that was done in Philadelphia was done in compliance with that act. What that act says is if federal money is being used to support a construction project that is probably disturbing the ground, and if that disturbance, and, or if it's on, you have to get a federal permit, or if it's on federal property. So if that disturbance is liable to destroy something of significance from the past, then they either have to avoid it, by redesigning whatever the project is, and obviously they can't do that with a courthouse in Lower Manhattan, or mitigate it, which means doing a full-out excavation. So it's the kind of archaeology that we get to do in places that you couldn't do archaeology in if you were just an academic. Because you couldn't say, I want to dig up that block in Lower Manhattan. We only got to dig up that block in Lower Manhattan because of the law. Which, which requires that we don't lose the information that would be there. So the thing that's significant about this site where the courthouse was built, it was in the, the heart of an old neighborhood called the Five Points. If you saw the main, uh, movie Gangs of New York, that's the neighborhood that we're talking about. So because Five Points was, is famous, it's infamous, the most notorious slum, 19th, 19th century slum in 19th century New York, so it was obvious that we were the, a, a project would have to be done to study what these remains might contribute to our real knowledge of the place. So here's the most famous image of Five Points. You see it over and over again, um, no matter how we correct it and how we say that it's myth, uh, it it will appear forever because it's a, such such a darn good painting and there's so much exciting street life, right? The excavation for the courthouse was on this block. You see how close it is to the Five Points intersection. Phenomenal. Phenomenal that we should have an opportunity to look into the reality of the place that had such a reputation. So that's the excavation. The brick building on the other side is the prison where the, uh, the people who bombed the Trade Center were being held. And eventually they built, when, once the courthouse was built where the excavation, you, where you see the excavation, there was a tunnel under the street to the, bring the prisoners under the street to the courthouse. And we also monitored the construction of that tunnel under plates in the street. So I could hear the trucks you know, driving over the plated street as we were watching to see what might be uh, in, the in the path of the tunnel. So much to our surprise and everybody else's, 
artifacts from, we call this an archaeological feature, it's a cesspool, and it was full of artifacts that related to an Irish tenement. Now, you know, part of the reputation of Five Points is that it was just crawling with gangs with names like Plug Uglies and Dead Rabbits and other criminals, and, um, and it was a ab place of abject poverty. So when we started to find these kinds of artifacts at Staffordshire Teaware, we thought, gosh, we must be in the wrong place. I mean, this couldn't be the Five Points because it just didn't, you know, conform to its reputation at all. And not only did they have Staffordshire Teawares, which would have been from the old world, these, these deposits in that cesspool dated to the 1830s and 40s into the early 50s. So it's just the period when the Irish are streaming into Manhattan. So um, not only you know, did they have Staffordshire, which would have been just what they had at home to drink tea, tea wear on, but also just the fact these are inexpensive dishes, this edgeware. It's the most ex inexpensive dishes you could buy. But the fact that it's matching with matching serving pieces shows that you know, there's a big effort to set you know, a fairly formal table. So that's, you know, nobody believed it. You know, when they looked at this assemblage, and it included, we also found these figurines, and the figurines um, would have been decorative in apartments. Now, there's no question that the apartments in, in Five Points were very small and overcrowded, and people had to take turns sleeping. I mean, you know, it was very difficult. There was no question that it was, people were poor. But they were poor, but they were, they were, were you know, looking, trying to be respectable. They were striving for respectability. Oh. This Father Matthew was proselytizing. He was a monk from Ireland who came to New York in 1849, and he was, was um, preaching temperance. So he obviously came to the Five Points neighborhood and was preaching temperance. But this cup, when, you see, when we do archaeology and when we look at these artifacts, you get all sorts of information out of them. I mean, obviously, the presence of, of Father Matthew there makes you know that there were people interested in temperance. They're not, not just down and out plug uglies and dead rabbits, right? There's something else going on there. And the thing is, this cup was not used to drink tea. Oh, well, maybe once or twice. But we know it wasn't used on a regular basis because there are no scratches on the interior of the cup. So it was a decorative object, just the, just the way the, um, the figurines were decorative objects. And then there was even China for children with names on it. Well, you know, middle class, 19th century, they talked about, you know, giving your children a sense of possession, learning how to be good consumers, learning how to own things. And also there were sayings on children's China that told you how to be a good boy or a good little girl. So it's very interesting that in this neighborhood where everybody was supposed to be in, not only poor but immoral because those things got conflated, um, that we have this kind of cop coming out of this assemblage. So this is pretty amazing. So I want to go back. When you have an, an assemblage like this, there were 850,000 artifacts from the Five Points site, you, you can't just do an inventory. I mean, you can make a very boring report that tells you every artifact that you've looked at, and you can even have pictures of them, and you can tell many how many shirts there are, and all that kind of stuff. Boring, boring, boring. So when I was working on this project, I was the principal investigator for the project, I thought, how can I bring this stuff to life? How can I do something with it that makes us know what it really means? Because just counting up artifacts doesn't really tell you what it really means. So I developed something called a narrative vignette, and I'm going to read you a little of one of these vignettes. There were um, 14 lots on the Five Points site, which means that we have features like cesspools or wells or privies that were full of artifacts, and um, I used the artifacts and the documentary information to be able to sort of weave little stories that were not made up. They're stories that simply coherently put together all the information we know. So I'm going to read you one, not about the Irish tenement, but about a Orthodox Jewish household that lived on the same block. Now already you see that Five Points is very different than the mythic stories that are told about it, because it wasn't just Irish gangs who were living there, there were all sorts of other people living there, including this nice 
Goldberg family. So in, let's see, in uh, 1840, Harris Goldberg lived with his wife, a servant, and a house full of male boarders in a two-story wooden house at 472 Pearl Street. The boarders were apprentices or rabbinical students, maybe both, and they ate with the family, bringing the number of people at the table to seven on some nights. The Goldbergs kept a kosher home, not unusual among Jews in New York. Harris was the sexton of a local synagogue and also worked as a tailor on Orange Street. He ate all his meals at home, keeping to a diet of beef. I don't know what I'm going to show you here. Oh, back here. They had two different sets of everyday dishes, because if you keep kosher, you have to have one dish for milk and one dish for meat. So these are the two least expensive kinds of dishes you could buy in that period. One is the edgeware that we already saw, that what's in the Irish tenement, and one is the willow one on the left. So just the fact that there were two sets of everyday dishes in this assembly so, uh, told us something about them. He ate all his meals at home, keeping to a diet of beef, always from the four shanks, since hind quarters were not considered kosher unless all veins had been removed, poultry and fish. A roast beef and sometimes a brisket were standard, based on olive oil and necessity for the Jewish cook who couldn't mix dairy with meat. Mrs. Goldberg used imported olive oil. We have a lot of olive oil bottle seals, which I don't have in this show. She made soup, and I do have soup bones. So they had decanter and matching wine glasses, etc. And they had this to this lead seal with a Hebrew letter on it. And what that meant was that the Hebrew letter indicated when the chicken that it would have been attached to had been slaughtered. So you had to keep track of that. We didn't know, we archaeologists had no idea why there was a lead seal with a Hebrew letter on it. But somebody who visited the lab told us that that, that was the, the, the um, custom. On most nights, Mrs. Goldberg set the table with her edge-decorated de dish, the set she used for meal. There was a platter for the roast and matching vegetable dishes for dairy meals, including fish. There was the willow pattern plates and the matching square and oval serving dishes. Elegantly decorated decanters held wine, adding sparkle to the table as cut ovals and scalloped paint panels caught the light. There was plenty of wine on the Goldberg table, perhaps the traditional blessings that were part of the Jewish Friday night supper, drunk from matching tumblers and firing glasses. It reminded the family of its Jewish roots and loosened the tongues of the otherwise shy boarders. Now I had found out, we found out that Harris Goldberg was a rabbi, the head of this household. What we do with archaeology, with historical archaeology, with urban archaeology, is you just, once you have an assemblage, once you've dated all the artifacts in it, then you search for any information that might be pertinent to understanding the people who lived there. So we actually found mention of Harris Goldberg in a book about early Jews in New York. <coughs> we also had the census records and the property records and all that stuff, and so all of that got woven into the story that we could tell. Okay, so with this approach, and there are the beef bones for the soup that could be left on the stove from Friday night to Saturday night when you couldn't turn on or off the stove. So as you can see from those kind, that kind of story that we could tell and from the fact that the artifacts from the Irish tenement and the artifacts from the Jewish household were so different than the mythic you know, presentations of five points, it it's, um, shows you what historical archaeology can do, what urban archaeology can do. It can bring the reality of the past to life in a much different way than the yellow journalism of the day or whatever it is that doesn't necessarily get down to the, you know, the real <coughs> material record. I mean, archaeology is undeniable. I mean, once you connect those artifacts to the people who lived there, they were their artifacts. I mean, you've got to be able to explain that. It's not something that we're making up. So I brought this method to Philadelphia. And this is my first big project in Philadelphia. This is the second block of Independence Mall. Now, you can see that, let's see, I guess I have a little pointer here. This concrete cradle held up the park that was there before they started to do the restoration of the mall, which they started to do in, starting in about 2000, 1999, 2000. So that is a, is, was holding that up. That 
this column came down into the basement of a building that had been there before the mall was created in the 1950s. And where we, urban archaeologists in Philadelphia, are usually digging is beneath the basement floors that were left in the ground when they took down the building. So what they did on Independence Mall, it was all full of buildings. I wish I had brought that picture that shows you. All, you know, those three blocks were jam-packed with buildings. Park Service took down all, there are photographs of them in the archives, incidentally. They took down all of those buildings. When they took down a 19th century building, they threw all the debris into the basement on top of the floor. So what we do when we go to an archaeological project is we work with big, heavy machinery like this. The machine, and Tommy was our back holder. Uh, and he was terrific. And he, of course, had never worked with archaeologists before. So he didn't know. He had to take orders from us. And the wonderful thing is that these backup drivers are so skilled. So if you say, I want you to take off one inch so that you don't disturb what I'm looking at underneath the one inch, they do it. They know how to do it, right? They can control it. So it's fantastic. So what he did is he lifted up the floor of the basement in this particular location. And we, and that is me in the green, are down there in a, in a privy. Privies are the hole under the outhouse. I hope you know that. So when you're looking at the bottom of her privy, because the 19th century building had stripped off the, uh, the uh, overlying ground and um, stripped off the top of the, of the privy. So if it's a shaft going up, the top of the shaft has already been destroyed. And we are down at the bottom of the shaft looking to see what we can find. So there is the shaft, and you see the basement wall is still in place, but Tommy removed the wall for us so that we could really excavate that particular uh, feature. So this is what we found in the feature, these beautiful glass bottles. I mean, you never know. You know you're out there in the dirt and the machines and the noise and the hard hats and you know, it's, it's the weather, all that stuff. And this is, you find these amazing things. Uh, when we urban archaeologists are digging, we often talk to each other about what, it, what we're finding. You know, you, you, it's a constant conversation. You're constantly saying, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. It's sort of a, it's an intellectual process, and it's really fun. But if people overhear us, they think we're absolutely nuts. Because, you know, if you pass us in 35 minutes, we may have changed our minds. It may be something different. So in this case, we thought we had a tavern, because we had all these smoking stuff, and we had all those bottles, and it must be a tavern. We were absolutely wrong because once we did the documentary record that fit, you know, once we did the census research and figured out who had lived there when this stuff was thrown out, we found that it was William Simmons. And William Simmons was a clerk in the auditor's office in the George Washington administration. So Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton was his boss. And then he was the chief accountant in the War Department in the Adams administration. <coughs> so, wow, you know, who knew? <laughs> who knew? So, gave me an opportunity to write another one of these little narratives, and I want to just read you a little bit of Mr. Simmons. And I was able to write this narrative basically because serendipitously I ran into um, letters that Mr. William Simmons had written and were published in Alexander Hamilton's published papers. I don't even remember how I happened to do that. I certainly wouldn't have thought Simmons was going to be in Alexander Hamilton's papers, but I was in the, you know, those open stacks at the University of Pennsylvania are absolutely wonderful because you can look at whatever you have to stumble upon. So was, I stumbled upon Hamilton's papers, I looked in the index, my William Simmons was in the index, and he was a grouchy guy. He was a, um, a stickler for let, not letting the rich get away with anything and for following the rules. So this is my um, beginning of my narrative for William Simmons. It's not hard to imagine a disgruntled William Simmons trudging up 6th Street, muttering under his breath, Hyde stole the money, that's what he did. He stole the money and now the soldiers are out there paying. Why doesn't McHenry see it? 
Why doesn't he care? James McHenry, the Secretary of War in the John Adams administration, was Simmons' boss, and they didn't see eye to eye. The issue um, that was on Simmons' mind that chilly April day in 1799 was one of many. In this case, Mr. Hyde, the paymaster to the first US regiment, had received a very large sum of money, part of which was intended for the soldiers but they had not gotten their pay, and Simmons was upset about that. The officers thought Simmons took advantage of their rank, and McHenry turned a blind eye. This was neither just nor legal. He would write a letter, but not tonight. Tonight, he would be sit by the fire with a comforting glass of gin, hopefully the gin that bottles are next. No, those are his uh, underwear buttons and his uh, straight pins. Straight pins were like, uh, like um, paper clips. So there's the, the glass of gin. Little did he know that the worst was yet to come. In October 1799, the president, no less, wanted Simmons to pay Hugh McAllister, a citizen, a reward for capturing the deserter. Simmons refused, noting the prevailing con custom in effecting settlements here when deserters have been pursued or apprehended, when detachments have been sent, blah, blah, blah. It will be permitted. So on April 17, 1799, as the sun was going down, Simmons approached his doorway at 9 North 6th Street. He had only one thing in mind, drink and maybe a little dinner. He wondered what the cook had, had in store for him. Would there be an almond pudding, his favorite, before the roast chicken, or would it be the usual corn? Maybe it would not be chicken at all. Perhaps the cook had gotten a piece of beef or pork at the market. That would go well with the Madeira he had tucked in the cellar. Ah, yes, a warm glass full and a full stomach would take the mind off Mr. Hyde and Mr. Henry. He quickened his step. Last year, at this time, Simmons would have looked forward to the company of Hezekiah Hosmer, representative of New York, and Senator Samuel Livingston of New Hampshire. Both had boarded with him at 9 North 6 and approved amiable drinking companions, even though their allegiance to federalism was a good deal more solid than his own. Trouble with damn federalists, mused Simmons, is that they are more interested in advancing the rights of their own kind than serving the democratic ideals described so eloquently by Mr. Jefferson. And to think that I owe my present position in the War Department to Alexander Hamilton. And then, actually, uh, I found a recommendation that Hamilton had written for Simmons when he was going to be advanced to the War Department. So I'm not going to read any further. But you see the point of this is that you take the material and integrate it with everything else you know to sort of bring it to life, to bring this person whose stuff we've been rubbling around in, um, could, what it could mean. Now, the thing about Simmons is that he worked in the auditor's office, and you don't usually hear about the clerks and the people who work in the auditor's office, and you know, the bureaucrats, we don't usually hear about them. We hear, hear about the fancy rich guys who wrote the Declaration of Independence and, you know, invented the first bank. I mean, all of that, that's this, what, who we celebrate from that period. But imagine how many of these clerks were. It's changed my whole feeling for what Philadelphia was like in that decade when the government, the federal government, was seated in Philadelphia in the 1790s. So Simmons would have been scurrying up the street to his office, which is marked by a little sign next to the first bank on 3rd Street. So that sign that you can't read in the slide, unfortunately, says it's the auditor's office. So of course, before we found Simmons, you know, you sort of, who cares what's the audit auditor's office, and you don't know who the auditor was. And it's, a whole, it's, it's bringing to life a whole part of that piece of the past that wasn't there. It wasn't there. It's not. It's not the same as history. It's, micro, it's a kind of micro-history, but it's fleshing out things and making you ask questions that you might not have asked unless you had stumbled on Simmons in an urban excavation. So um, I'm crazy about Mr. Simmons. You see, I'm just totally in love with him. He's my favorite person that I found in Philadelphia. But there are other wonderful people that we found in Philadelphia. And as a matter of fact, across the street, from Simmons' office is uh, the site of the Museum of the American Revolution. That's what the site looked like when we, when they had taken down, I don't know if you remember, but there was a visitor center on 3rd Street that was built in 1976, I think. And uh, so they had taken down the 19th century buildings that stood there. And uh, we had to take, well, not we, but the people building the Museum of the American Revolution had to take down that visitor center 
after much wrangling over where the Museum of the American Revolution should be. So there was a lot of controversy over the site because originally the museum was going to be built at Valley Forge. But somehow people at Valley Forge, Park Service people, other people, people in the federal government, decided they didn't want the Museum of the American Revolution, which is a private institution. They didn't want that up at Valley Forge. So Jerry Lenfest, that wonderful, generous man who has supported so many terrific cultural things in Philadelphia, bought land across the street so they could build the museum there. And they didn't want it there either. So Lenfest and Rendell decided they should trade the site that they had bought near Valley Forge for the site on 3rd Street where the museum was originally built. Well, they bought the site on 3rd Street, or they traded it, and then there was a money exchange also. But that came with the requirement to do cultural resource management, to, do, to comply with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. So we had to do, I had to, it was a wonderful project. So we got to excavate this site. So when we excavate a site, an urban site like this, I give them a budget. Right? So I had given them a proposal. We got hired to do the project. I told them it's going to cost you a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> I look at the site when I start, and I think, oh, God, you know, I've made a terrible mistake. There's not going to be anything there. How foolish, how dumb, what are we going to do? It's going to be so awful. You don't. Urban archaeology is phenomenal. Because who would think that stuff could be preserved in an urban environment where, you know, buildings, there, there were 18th century shops on this block, then there were 19th century commercial buildings, then, was the, then there was the uh, visitor center that was built in the 1970s. So there's been a huge amount of disturbance. How possibly could there be anything left? So I told them there was, and there would be, and thank God there was. <laughs> So this is um, one of the pretties that we found on a lot that had belonged to a lover, lovely Quaker couple named uh, Benjamin and Mary Humphreys. And they had moved to Carter's Alley. The middle of that lot, the uh, area had a, an alley sticking through it that went east to west that hasn't been visible since they built the visitor center in the 1970s. However, we map. We, we use the historic maps to figure out what we can anticipate on a site that we're going to approach. So this particular lot had belonged to Benjamin and Mary Humphrey. Benjamin was a cutler. That could mean he made flatware, like silverware. However, it isn't, that's not what he made. He made screws. And we know that he made screws of all different sizes because before he moved, to Carter's Alley from Chestnut Street, he sold his screw machine. So he advertised it in the Pennsylvania Gazette. So this is another thing. You see what kinds of sources we look at, census records and the old newspaper records, and all the records that can be brought to bear on a place that we're trying to understand. So we were, um, we, um, this is a good time to tell those of you who have never been exposed to it, how we excavate these sites. So when you get a privy that is round like that, or one of these other features is round, you cut it in half. And the reason we cut it in half and excavate it in half is so that we can see the layers. Oh, that's not the right thing. So that we can see the layers going down. <coughs> because every layer is excavated separately. And it has to be. Because each layer might represent a different occupant of the site. So we, have, we take the artifacts from each layer and they are labeled in such a way that we'll always be able to know where they came from, specifically in the ground, horizontally and vertically. Very important, very important. So Catherine there is scraping the profile so she can see the different layers. Notice that this lime deposit isn't, oh, it's up here. So as we go down in these urban sites, we have to um, you know, pay attention to OSHA regulations. And you're not allowed to be in a constricted pet space. I think it's four feet. I can't exactly remember if it's four feet. So when you've gone down four feet and you're in one of those brick shafts, you have to knock off the top of the brick shaft. So again, you have the machine operators standing right there. This delicate archaeology, right? Okay, um, that's what it's like. So the machine operator knocks off the top of it because you've already recorded it layer by layer. And you keep going down. So. 
Catherine kept going down, and um, the glass was analyzed by Alex Bartlett. You may know him, he works at the Conservancy here. And Alex was a fantastic uh, field archaeologist before he worked at the Conservancy here, and he was my right hand man, I guess is what you said. And um, he analyzed the glass. He knows all about glass. He's known about glass since he was a little boy collecting milk bottles along the railroad tracks. And he's, he was wonderful to have on a site, because the minute you find a piece of glass, you'll hold it up, and Alex will tell you where it was made, when it was made, what it is, you know, it's absolutely fantastic. So we find all this beautiful glass in that privy that you just saw, and he says it's a tavern. I say, Alex, it's not a tavern. This is Benjamin and Mary Humphreys, who came to Chestnut Street, you know, this nice, dignified Quaker couple when they came to Chestnut Street in 1776. They manumitted their enslaved African named Kwanshiba. They changed the Quaker meeting houses that they were gonna worship at. You know, this is not a, not a tavern. Alex said, he's absolutely sure. It was 100 bottles. He's sure, there's no question, this is a tavern assembly. And of course, when the ceramics person, these are, these are um, tankards, uh, different regulation sizes. So the more we looked at the assemblage, the more we know it's a tavern. Well, to run a tavern in that period, you had to have a license. And so we can go to the archives and find the license for the tavern that the Humphreys ran. So I went to the Historical Society, and Todd Benedict, who's another person who worked closely with me, um, went to the archives, and I found one mention of a tavern license before they moved to Carter's Alley. But Todd found this other terrific thing, which is this, um, this you know, document that says that Mary Humphreys has charged with running an, a, a disorderly house. So if you go down, and a disorderly house in those days was an unlicensed tavern with prostitutes hanging about by a nice Quaker couple. And you know, we have beautiful white dishes that they were setting their table with. But this is what this document says. And if you read in this document, these are all the guys who made this decision. Uh, sworn and affirmed respectively to say that Mary Humphreys is guilty of keeping a disorderly house, where, but that she is not guilty of the particular charge in the bill. We wonder about that. Maybe she didn't have prostitutes. I don't know. I don't know. But the judgment is that she is committed to the jail of this city and Saturday week next, and that on the said day she is carted through the city that she uh, has afterwards confined in the workhouse at hard labor for three months, that she pay the costs of the prosecution and stand committed till this sentence is complete. <coughs> wow, we're not being completely, you know, it's a little unclear. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to explain that. But, um, and so we don't know whether she really was part of the city, whether she did spend the time at hard labor. Presumably she did. But we do know that she went back to Carter's Alley and she lived to a ripe old age, uh, dying in 1822. So, you know, she was a good girl. <laughs> she was a lively person. And it's to discover that kind of thing, um, you know, it just shows you the complexity of urban places and all the different things people are doing in different periods. And that even though we just get this little peek hole into the past on a little archaeological site that happens to be investigated because it's in the way of construction, it's amazing what you can learn. I mean, this Museum of the American Revolution site is, covers a quarter of a block, and we have the whole history of Philadelphia there. I mean, in microcosm, but we have the whole history. This particular privy also produced the most important artifact that we found on the site. And this is a punch bowl. When Catherine, you saw Catherine digging there, she came down to the bottom of the night soil, which is human waste, which tends to be what is in the bottom of these privies. It's very sticky, it preserves things very nicely, and it doesn't smell the way you would think it smells. It doesn't smell pleasant, but it smells different. And anyway, so at the bottom were these little shirts she saw that seemed to have words on them, and a boat on uh, um, you know, the day it was very exciting. She called us all over and we're looking down at these shirts and thinking, what could this be? What could this be? So finally it gets back to the lab and there are more shirts and you paste it together and you see that it's a punch bowl and it says success to the trifana. 
Well, happily, because of those newspapers that I was telling you about before, um, you can trace the Trifena. So we know that the Trifena went back under Captain John Smith, went back and forth to Liverpool um, in the 1760s. So in the, Smith is bringing in, the boat is bringing in loads basically of textiles, and they're described in great detail, and then they're delivered to various shops, some of them on Market Street, some of them on Chestnut Street. So that's cool, but there's one load that was one trip that tells what went from Philadelphia to Liverpool, only one. And what went was a request from the merchants and traders of this city, it's the bottom paragraph, to the mechanics and manufacturers of Great Britain, paying them to interest themselves in endeavoring to get the Stamp Act repealed and other regulations in our trade redressed, is now drawn up and forged and is to be forwarded by Captain Smith for Liverpool. We found this on the site of the Museum of the American Revolution. Uh, Near, needless to say, they were very pleased. I mean, it's, it, it, it is the mission of the museum to discuss the revolution, and here, here is a mention of the Stamp Act. Um, this artifact we find in the night soil at the bottom of a privy that looks the way you saw the privy look. So it's pretty, pretty fantastic. All, there was also another punch bowl in the assemblage which Rob um, Hunter, who's a famous ceramics expert in this field, thinks is the first piece of real porcelain ever manufactured in this country. And it was manufactured, and it dates to between 1770 and 1772, because the factory where it was probably made by Bonin and Morris was the factory name, which was in the immediate vicinity, and we know they made a lot of soft paste porcelain, but this would have been hard paste porcelain. Incidentally, when this artifact came into the lab, none of us knew what the hell it was. You know, so we all looked and tried to feel knowledgeable and realized that he didn't know what it was. And even Rob Hunter didn't know he had to send it to an expert who did a chemical analysis and swears that this is um, the real thing. So that's all very exciting, especially for ceramics experts. So, as I said before, the Museum of the American Revolution site, and there's a whole chapter in the book on this site which tells you about the politics and the controversy and the finds on the site as well, uh, it is, it is the whole history of Philadelphia. So this comes from the earliest uh, lot on the lot, at the earliest period that we excavated on the lot, at the turn of the 18th century. That's gorgeous German Westerwald jug. And there were a lot of Germans who had come very early in Philadelphia's history to work in the tan yards, which were very close to this block, right down on Dock Street. I don't know if you know Dock Street, but Dock Street, of course, is in the place of the old Dock Creek. And the Dock Creek was lined with tan yards making a horrible mess. So we think that um, this could have been a Ger German worker's household. There's a cattle horn, that's what that thing on the left is, and you find those on tanyard sites, and we found a lot of debris. Uh, oh, I love this. This is um, from that same feature, and there are loads of fruit uh, pits, it's peaches and other pits, and we think that there was somebody who was baking, probably selling things for sale, because this big thing, which I had no idea what it was, and again, I learned from somebody who visited, in fact, I think it was when I was giving a lecture, somebody said it's for taking pies out of the oven. It's, you know, it's, a, it's not a spatula for turning things over, it's for, for getting them out so you don't have to get too, too close to the heat, so I like that. So that, that was a little tiny, house that was on the alley. And then on Chestnut Street, there was a guy in the 1730s, I guess, who um, was probably, he might have been an owner of one of the tanyards, which was right, right down the hill. But his stuff was a little fancier. So these are, um, wet, uh, what you call it, fan. Those are the things that make up a fan. These are wet uh, curlers. No hair curlers, and buttons, and buckles, and more underwear buttons. I love the underwear buttons. Mm -hmm. So that's to the, so we have the turn of the 18th century, then you get to the 18th, to the 1730s, 
And also in that feature was a lot of debris from what must have been another drinking establishment. You'd think, you know, yeah, this place is wall-to-wall -wall drinking establishments. That is true, and everybody <laughs> did drink all the time in this period. So it's not surprising that we have so much debris from them. These are posset pots. Posset is a terrible sounding rig. Curdled milk with some kind of alcohol in it. I love the cups, but uh, I don't think I would want to drink the drink. And again, regulation size tent, uh, tent uh, what you call it? And this beautiful, which is on the front of the book, this beautiful charger. So it's a big sort of serving platter. Also not scratched up, so it was obviously used decoratively. Those circular things are pomegranates. And it was made probably in Bethlehem, by Moravian, what's known as, who is known as the Moravian potter. Very beautiful piece. So then we have the revolutionary period stuff, which is Mrs. Humphrey's stuff. And then in the middle of the 19th century on this block, David Jane, who was a, a, a medicine, you know, a, what you call it, manufacturer, uh, built a very substantial building out of granite. And some people believe that this is the first skyscraper, size skyscraper, because it was eight feet tall with a tower two more feet up. And it was, I mean, obviously this is a guy who was showing off because everybody else is still in their little, little <laughs> places, and he's got this monster of a building in which he's selling prescription, not prescription, what is the word? The other kind of medicine. Um, you know, over the counter. The fake medicines. Oh. The fake medicines, I'm forgetting the word. Anyway, he's selling those, he's publishing a magazine that tells you how you can keep yourself healthy, and you know, he is a mover and a shaker. And this building was a significant building, and it was standing until the 1970s. And in the 1970s, when the Park Service created um, the park, basically, no, we created, when they built the visitor center, they wanted to take down this building. But Charlie Peterson, who was a historic architect who was working at the park at the time, argued that you should not take this building down because historically it was such an important building. I loved, I'm going to go back to the foundations. I loved finding those foundations because I would look up and say, Charlie, you know, the building, at least it didn't lose its foundations. Its foundations are still here in the ground. They're not anymore, though. They were hauled away. They wanted to haul, they wanted to sort of take them to a park in West Philadelphia, but these pieces of granite were so long and so heavy that it was too difficult to really do anything but destroy them on site, which is sort of sad because it was nice to think that they had been there. Notice you can see um, the first bank. So you see the relationship between where Mr. Simmons was and where Miss, Miss Mary Humphreys was and where David Jane was. And that's the thing about urban archaeology. We're seeing the city in process. You see this development over this long time, long period. There's Dr. David Jane. Great. And of course, we found a few bottles that belonged to, belonged to the building. And there was also a door that led under the alley that led to an extension on the building that was built later. It was a very exciting find. And the last thing that we found are the remnants of a button factory that was there in the 1920s, probably 1910s and 1920s. And so there are thousands of buttons, and this is a good time to say that you can't take it all back to the lab, because you'd be swamped for everything, forever, so you sample it. So we have samples of these shells, which came from Southeast Asia, out of which buttons were cut, and they stopped at the Second World War when they couldn't get the stuff from Southeast Asia anymore. So you see the... the, the transformation of this one little part of Philadelphia, and of course it was happening in many other parts of Philadelphia too, but you, we just got to peek in to that part of Philadelphia, which was very special. So now we have to sort of change um, subjects. One, uh, okay, I'm getting a signal from the back. Maybe I should read, I don't know. Well, anyway. One of the other chapters in the book is about burial grounds, because burial grounds keep popping up. And the reason burial grounds, and not only in Philadelphia, the reason they keep popping up is that places that were parking lots to serve the automobile era now 
uh, the only open space left in the city. So they get excavated. And when they were made into parking lots, all of the garbage from the previous occupants of the buildings that had been there got buried under the parking lots. So that's, that was true at the Five Point site. It was a parking lot. Um, and this, in this instance, this was not a parking lot. And this was not a Section 106 uh, compliance project because these people were not using public money. So it wasn't federal money or federal property or federal permits. That, that, and so they were not, they didn't have to do archaeology. However, somebody was walking by this site, it was at 2nd and Art Street, and they noticed that human bones were being flipped into the air by the backhoes that were driving around on the site. So um, that was a problem. But as this newspaper article said, nobody wanted to take responsibility. So this physical anthropologist who was working at Rutgers Camden and Anna Doty, whose picture's in the paper today, who's at the Mutter Museum, convinced the developer to let them go on the site for at least a week to see what was there. And so they did that with a lot of volunteers. And uh, the volunteers could not excavate the burials there were 78 burials that were actively being destroyed when they caught that construction in action. So they laid the burials on these, um, what, what did they call them, but whatever they were. They, they put them on there and took, removed them and stored them in a dog training. They found an old warehouse that had been a dog place and they, it's called the wagging tail. And they excavated them on those platforms uh, for the, where they were moved. Unfortunately, the excavation continued and many more burials were found. So uh, they brought in the, the engineering company, AECOM, as a big archaeology division, and they excavated, I think, 340 more burials oh. or something like that. And they did excavate those in the field and photographed them in situ and everything, uh, which is great. However, so the, the company, the developer, which wasn't required to have paid for archaeology, archaeology is very expensive, this kind of urban archaeology. You can see why with the machines, with the, you know, and the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> so the developer paid to get the 345 additional burials out of the ground, but no money for analysis. No, this project has no money for analysis, even though the preservation is fantastic. It's the first time I've ever seen brains brains. So you see this, the, the skull with a brain balance, you know, a desiccated brain inside. I mean, it's phenomenal, phenomenal preservation. The burial ground was associated with one of the earliest churches in Philadelphia, 1715, the First Baptist Church. So, I mean, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, assemblage of our artifacts and information. So this wonderful woman, Kimberly Moran, who's at Rutgers Camden, has managed to put together a research team who is basically doing it all for free. I don't really know if that's true today because I haven't really talked to her on the telephone for, you know, some, some number, some time. So, however, when this picture was taken, taken, it was all being done by free. Done all in England, at Penn, at, you know, every institution in the area, in New Jersey, this guy, uh, Beatrice, who is a physical anthropologist, he's analyzing the skeletons one by one using student labor. The guy here, the hand in the bottom, which is holding a comb, he has been analyzing the coffin hardware. I mean, just phenomenal, because they're getting such information, and they're collaborating, which is a very beautiful thing to see. People who get hired on contracts are not as collaborative. So, Kimberly has done something very special by encouraging that collaboration. It's much better to not have to dig up a burial ground and certainly not have it dug up by developers who don't know what they're doing. So this is, as you can see, the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, which was founded in about 1790, I think we decided, it's about, it's about that. And uh, here's Reverend Allen, Richard Allen, founder of the church. So there is this, this um, local historian named Terry Buckalo who stumbled across a reference to a burial ground that nobody knew about associated with that church. Once the church ran out of space around the church, they had to find other land. So a few blocks away, they found other land. And 
the Wakako Playground, I never know if I'm pronouncing that right, was being renovated in, at this location between Catherine and Queen Street, and that's where that additional burial ground was. So Terry Buckaloo, the local historian, made a big fuss. They hired uh, Aidy Kahn to do an excavation there, and they're doing it in the presence of the community. Very important. Um, I worked for a company, John Milner Associates, who did one of the first excavations of an African burial ground, First African Baptist Church, in fact there were two. They did that in the late 80s and early 90s. And through that project, they recognized how important it is to work with the descendant community. And so since then, everybody has been very carefully working with the descendant community. So that's an example. Uh, Doug Mooney, who's done a lot of archaeology in Philadelphia, is telling them what they're finding. And fortunately, the burials, which are between two and a half and four and a half feet, feet below uh, the surface, did not have to be actually excavated. You can't see in this slide, probably, but there's scratched marks. So they've gotten down to the level where the burials would be. They know they're there, but they don't have to dig them up, which is a blessing. So they're still there. And I think there was an article in the paper a couple of weeks ago about they had a contest for somebody to design how they should be interpreting the, the site now that um, it's been identified. And there they are with the historic marker, which is terrific. And Kim Morrell, who is another Kim and another physical anthropologist and works for AECOM, has excavated many of the burial grounds in Philadelphia. And she's very sensitive to the fact that burial grounds shouldn't be excavated at all. I mean, she has to do it because it's in compliance, because there's construction, because something's going, it's going to be disturbed, and you have to do it, and you have to do justice to it, and you an analyst. But she would like that not to happen. So he, she has developed this map of burial grounds. And you notice they're all over the city because people didn't bury their dead away from the city. They lived near their dead, or they lived, you know, the, the burials were in the churchyard. So they're all, this is a database, and if you go online to the Philadelphia Archaeological Forum site, you can click on those squares, and it'll give you the information. When the burial ground was active, whether it was moved, whether it's, you know, been excavated, whether it hasn't been excavated. So hopefully, developers can use this as a guide to not develop a property where there was a burial ground in order to avoid having to dig it up. So that would be very nice. That is if the developers look. So this is, as I'm sure you've noticed, what I'm really interested in is the people. And I love, and the, and the, and the whole trajectory of the past, if that's the right word. This is where William Simmons lived, right? That's the visitor center on the middle block of uh, Independence Mall. This is the Museum of Mary, uh, Rev American Revolution. This is where Mrs. Humphreys had her illegal tavern. It's right down there in the basement, you can tell. You know, and people even talk about it. Now, this is where Mrs. Humphreys' ta tavern used to be. This is the building that's on the Arc Street burial ground. Now, I love that it, they sort of imitates an industrial building. It's not an old building, it's a new building. So this is what we have now but with the archaeology, we can also have the memory of what was there before. So you have a kind of deeper understanding of how the city changes over time. It's a, it's a dynamic thing. I love that. And uh, there's the courthouse that stands on the Five Points site. And last week, when E. Jean Carroll came out of those gold doors, that's what gave me the idea for this lecture, I said, I know those gold doors. That's the courthouse at Five Points. And she came, she and the lawyer came right out, out there. And it's just so, so different. I want you to have this experience. I want you to be able to look at things in the present and read my book and know what was there before and just have this sense of how the city develops and uh, changes over time. And there's something just tr tremendously fun about it. And, um, I want everybody to have that fun. I felt this way the whole time I'm doing archaeology. When I'm deeply in a project and I'm looking at the world that I'm excavating and thinking about excavating, thinking, oh, everybody should know that this, that this was here in the past and that what's here now makes it more interesting than it was here in the past. Thank you. in the uh, 
in New York and we're doing five points. But up there by the federal building, there's an the African uh, burial site that they discovered when they were trying to build. Yes, there. I was very involved. Yeah. Is that, that's a different spot? Is that a it's a different spot. They were building, the poor General Services Administration yeah. was building these two huge buildings at the same time. Yeah. And uh, they ran into resources for both. The African burial ground caused, you know, much more controversy than the five point seven. Yeah, I remember reading about that. Yeah, yeah, a lot. A lot. Okay. Yeah. So did they have to move the people or did they, did they eventually move the people? Uh, they excavated. They excavated many burials and uh, they were taken to Howard University. First they were taken to Lehman College in New York, then they were taken to Howard University. Howard University insisted that they were the right wow. people to do the African burial ground for obvious political reasons. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, why does it seem that dishes in China, glass here, gets into a crib? Uh -huh. How does that happen? A very basic question. It's because when they break, you throw them out. Right. Uh, or when you move, I have one site which was obvious a new wife was coming in, and everything from the old wife had been thrown out. <laughs> you, you, you have. How does it get down into the... Well, because you don't have garbage collection. There's no, gar no garbage truck coming by your property every week. You have to get rid of the stuff. Where are you going to get rid of the stuff? You know, down the halls that are available. So, <laughs> that's that's how it gets there. So sometimes it's deliberate. It's when the re you know the residences change, or or, um, or it's just in the process of living there and you're throwing things out as they break. But you think they take it with them? No. Well, do you remember? I don't know how long it's been since you've moved. But I remember moving from New Jersey, all those cardboard boxes, you know, out of the curve, uh, the stuff that needs to get thrown out. I mean, you know, you have to throw out a lot, a lot of stuff when you move. Yes, Nancy. So, Rebecca, thank you for your talk. Um, my husband and I lived in Elm Sally when I first oh. moved to uh, Philadelphia. And there were, of course, privy pits. And I wonder if privy pits were built at the same time that the brick houses were constructed. You mean, did people build themselves a privy as soon as they built yes, their house? Yes, exactly. Well, of course. I mean, you had to have a bathroom. I mean, let, let us face it, you had to have a privy. But we have evidence of people changing. You know, for instance, there was a site on the convention center site where they were using barrels. So a barrel was a very shallow privy. It didn't last very long. So there would be another barrel in the backyard or another barrel. So there are instances where, I don't know, did you just have one privy on that property? I, 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 we were always digging up little fragments of pottery. Right. Or, you know, we, we put a garden in and you know, we laid a brick patio down. Yeah. There was always things, you know, Popping up on the ground, sure. Because again, if you don't have garbage collection, a lot of stuff just gets thrown out in the backyard. I mean, an Alper salad had intact ground surface. It's not like a place where a commercial building has been built with a deep basement, and you know you're only looking at the bottom of the privet. You probably was there. Was the privet filled? Did it have stuff in it? Uh, I, I defer to you since you were the excavator. It, it, was, it went way down. It did. And, and you would have had to reinforce the sides to really. Deal with it. I see. So we covered it up and left, left, left it for the next person. Good. They came along and just filled it in. They filled it without yeah. looking to see what was without, in the bottom. Without really just as well, just as well. Better than you know, digging up and mixing everything up. Because as I said, it's got to go layer by layer. It's totally meaningless. Yes. When the cemeteries were dug up, were the bodies in, in caskets or were they just buried naturally? Caskets. Did you? See, you didn't see the caskets on that slide. Oh, they were in yeah, no, they're caskets. And one of the things that gets studied is the the shape of the caskets and the wood the caskets are made of and the, the hardware that is on the casket. You know, all of that contributes to our understanding of socioeconomic levels and racial preferences and you know all that stuff. Uh, Interestingly, um, some of those burials from the Arch Street burial ground had more than the appropriate number of ribs. <laughs> and the other neat, neat thing about that burial ground is according to my friend Coxie Tukit here, the historian, those churches, white churches, loved to have African American members, but they didn't want to bury them in their burial ground. However, 
it looks as if there were some buried in that burial ground uh, at Art Street. So analyzing the skeletons, you know, gives you all this other information. Terrible dental problems, terrible dental problems in those partic that particular population. Yes? Um, so what you're describing is so visual. Good. I'm wondering if there's, is there any place in the city where a museum has done a good job of like, I almost picture you can see four, you know, four layers of the history of a site or of a house. Um, this is my challenge, is to make this stuff exciting. That's why I write these books. You know, I, they spend all this money getting out of the ground. We better at least have a record of it, at least tell the stories that come from it. The Museum of the American Revolution is trying their damnedest, and they do have a reconstructed privy and the education department in the basement. But I would not say that any museum has really dedicated itself to telling the kind of detailed archaeology that I would want them to tell. But it's, it's very hard. It's, you know, it's hard to, to bring it to life. That's why I write these stories. I mean, you know, how can we bring it to life? How can I share with you how exciting it is to go through the process of finding it? So I mean, there was a period in my career where people said, we should speed it up. You know, we should. Uh, make those screens, just do the shaking themselves. We shouldn't have to do it. It should be faster. It should dig faster. No. Mm -hmm. Digging slowly. You have this feeling of going back into the past. And yes, it's tedious. And some people are bored out of their noggins. And sometimes you don't find anything. But there's something about it that takes you back. You know, it takes you, it gives you this sense of what it's about. <laughs> I just want to say, I had a friend who used to date an old tribute in old Philadelphia, and he came up with a massive gold and amethyst ring. Woo. Absolutely beautiful. And you wondered, did some romance go sour? <laughs> and whose ring was it? Um, I don't know if they ever found that. I, I bet he didn't dig in layers, and so I bet he couldn't yeah. find that. You know, because uh, often people who just dig privies mm -hmm. in the city, because they can find good stuff, don't go through the tedium. They don't have time, basically, because they're doing it after dark or something. And if you don't go layer by layer, you know, you can't match it up with uh, who might have lived there and who's, who's it might have. That sounds like a wonderful story that would have been fun to tell. I've seen the red. Yeah. And he was mostly looking for old bottles. Of course, which he could sell on the weekends to, you know, from his garage. I've worked with lots of machine operators who collect bottles and collect things but because, you know, they're into old stuff. And, it's, I, I don't ever, you know, it's okay, because we don't have time to really analyze everything that comes up out of the ground. Some people say, oh my God, isn't it terrible? You know, there's construction here and construction there. Nobody's doing archaeological investigation. No, it's okay, because the ones I've done, it takes years and takes a lot of money and takes a lot of expertise to really do it justice, to make it more than just we're collecting stuff. I mean, collecting stuff, you go to an antique store. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's a challenge. Yes? Um, I grew up in Minnesota. Yeah. In the late 60s, I was teaching an experimental anthropology class at one of the suburban high schools. Cool. And my husband and I were renting in a duplex, which you could tell had been originally a single family. Uh -huh. And the folklore was it had been a farmhouse. Uh -huh. And there were industrial stuff around. It was over by the university. And the garage was torn down, but you could see vague outlines of the base of the foundation. And I asked the owner permission over the summer so my students could sort of dig and see what we could find. Uh -huh. So we dug. And we found a couple boxes broken, again, broken glass, broken dishes. And then there were a bunch of sort of mysterious things. So the next, we did over the summer one day a week. Uh -huh. And in the fall, I went to an older teacher who'd grown up on a farm in North Dakota. And I showed him some of the stuff, and I said, there's these funny glass eggs. Some are broken, but one or two complete size of eggs with glass. I said, there's these funny, great big, like, staples. He said, the glass eggs sometimes to stimulate the female hens to lay, uh -huh. give them a glass egg. And he said, the staples, you put them in the pig's noses so they wouldn't dig up the potatoes. Ooh, so, I never so that. The fact that going back into historic records, but also trying to find out how did people at that time live. Absolutely. We dug up a privy in our neighborhood, the house was built by Quakers in the 1840s, and it had been used in brick and wood. We found a dictaphone <laughs> with discs in it, plus the other broken glass, broken this, broken that. Yeah. But uh, the, the link to 
how is it used, it's whatever. And that's you're going into historic records. Absolutely. That's, that's very that's everything. All the information yeah. that you can bring together. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.